But then there's a more recent uh, court case that is coming up as a direct challenge to the Bridgeport ruling. This was from um, 2016. This involves uh, VMG Sassol, which Sassol was like a, a disco record label from the 70s versus Madonna. This was a California case um, that basically rejected the bright line test um, set forward in Bridgeport. Now, what happened was Shep Pettibone uh, in Madonna's Vogue, okay, uh, used uh, a quarter of a second horn hit from um, this Sassel Orchestra song, um, Love Break. So uh, I'll play you here. We'll listen to the, the few seconds that has the horn hit from Sassel Orchestra. And we'll listen to Madonna's Vogue. I believe this is from the early 90s. All right, so pretty minimal. Not that important to Madonna's Vogue. You know, it's just kind of like an embellishment. It's not a main loop or anything. And what's the significance of this? Well, guess what? They ruled in favor of Madonna. When they went to court, Madonna's uh, representation, basically legal representation, said the use is de minimis. I mean, a quarter of a second. And the judge agreed and ruled in her favor and said that it was, uh, in fact, de minimis itself. And I think what's really important is this. We have two conflicting, you know, decisions here. One from 2005 that says anything you sample, you need to clear. And one from 2016 that says actually de minimis still stands up so the standard right now though the standard that most people are adhering to is the the bridgeport decision because people are afraid the interesting thing about the bridgeport decision if you look at a lot of like the hip-hop stuff that came out post 2005 a lot of it was like people like kanye west playing keyboards and stuff and like people who maybe weren't that musical on the keys and stuff a lot of people making beats because they they were relying on de minimis defenses before that, and they were afraid to, re you know, rely on that. So you have a lot of really bad um, music that started coming out then because people were afraid to sample. Now, what the judge said in this Sassol versus Madonna case was this: Judge Garber basically said to Bridgeport, because we conclude that Congress intended to maintain the de minimis exception for copyrights to sound recordings, we take the unusual step of creating a circuit split by disagreeing with the Sixth Circuit's contrary holding in Bridgeport. And what this sets up here is, is what we want, maybe, a Supreme Court case, you know, a decision in the Supreme Court. Now, Knowing that the Supreme Court's pretty friggin' conservative in, in general, pretty pro-business, you know, you, you have to have a feeling that if this went to the Supreme Court, now they rule in favor of, of basically, like, saying de minimis is not, is not a defense, you know, piss, piss off, like, you need to, to clear a sample, um, or else it's infringement. That, I just, that's my feeling that I feel like the Supreme Court would, would have there. Um, I'm going to play a little, a, little, a little bit from you. This is James Newton's choir. Pay attention to the flute sample here. Okay, this was used at the beginning of the Beastie Boys 1992 song, Pass the Mic. Um, and this is a case called Newton v. Diamond. And we'll just play this Beastie Boys clip from Pass the Mic and you'll, you'll, hear, the, you'll hear the flute sample pretty prominent. All right, so in 92, the Beastie Boys got a, um, you know, a master use license for the sound recording. At the time, um, you know, James Newton had sold off his sound recording rights or didn't own the master rights. He did own the compositional rights, the publishing. Well, they did not clear that. The Beastie Boys did not clear the six notes um, and three seconds of the flute, uh, of, of, of that flute, you know, composition. They cleared the master, so what you hear, but they did not clear the, the publishing or musical work side. 
James Newton sued them. It ended up going to court, and the court ruled in favor of the Beastie Boys for this. That basically, um, in the set of legal standard, that you can have a de minimis defense for compositions or for publishing or for songwritings or, 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 or for lyrics. So if, if you clear it on the master side, if you clear what you hear, right, um, but you only use, let's say you use three seconds of a sample and you clear it from the record label, maybe you'll decide to not clear it on the publishing side from the composer and lyricists um, and publishing companies because it's de minimis. So this, the significance here is that, you know, if you use a small amount of a sound recording and you use a small amount of a composition in that sound recording, your use could be and should be fair. But yeah, de minimis, you know, the law does not concern itself with trifles. It's a, you know, a, a Latin term, um, you know, Defendants can use it. So if I get sued for sampling, you can use it. If I sue someone for sampling, I could also use it in my in my legal case, basically saying like you didn't actually chop or change my sample my, my music enough. Like you know, uh, in the case of like MC Hammer or Puff Daddy type thing, you could say like you you minimally changed the the original. Um, but it, it's you know, standard wise, it's not. It's not a defense for sound recordings. Despite the Madonna case, like the precedent and the standard that you know, most comp mostly everybody's kind of adhering to is like small uses are are infringements. Just really watch what what you do, you know, with with that. Um, but it'll be interesting what this Madonna case brings up. I just think too, you know. This is something just to always think about. It's like, when I make a beat, I don't think anything about the law. I don't think anything about clearance. I don't think anything about, like, my shit's not valuable. No one cares. I do it because I love it. And that's what it is, right? And I may make a few bucks here and there, but, you know, whatever. But you have to think about chilling effects, you know? Like, how much great music did, didn't come out? You know, important music never came out because someone couldn't get the rights or because someone was afraid to sample. I mean, just think about post-2005. All these people who could have been making great music instead made total shit because they were playing Casio keyboards in a studio trying to be musical, <laughs> like, in that sense, you know, where maybe they didn't have the chops or the skills, you know. But just know what a chilling effect is, and we've seen this in patent, and we, we've seen it in sampling, where people are afraid to make music because they're afraid of being sued.